thank you for joining us this morning. I'm the Reverend Lorna Bradley and I'm here today with Audley Burnett. Say hello please Audley. Hello, <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to have you along and Audley's come to help me talk a little bit more about creation care because as you know for the last couple of weeks we've been doing different interviews over the weeks and we've done a few of the clergy, we've done Colin from West Wales Biodiversity and I've invited Audley along because he is one of you, he's one of our congregations who join us every week on a Sunday but he has a bit more to do with the church than just our Sunday congregation. He's active with me in the creation care group. So um, I guess the first thing we'd like to hear a bit is a bit about yourself, Audley. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Okay. Um, so I live above Drivach Velindre, which is to the south of Castanlaweth Emlyn, Newcastle Emlyn. And I've lived here for with my family who are now three grown up children who are still at times at home and my wife Nikki and we live on a few acres of land and which we care for in a shambling biodiverse permaculturally sort of way so um, biodiversity where we are is enormous even given what we expect in West Wales. And we're in a little valley where there are a number <clears throat> of small farms and small holdings, which also are involved in looking after the land in the most sustainable way. And that was a draw to us when we had our third child. And the other connection was I have um, roots going way back in terms of relatives more towards the Pembrokeshire side but all down here so it was a sense of wanting to have roots um, and I'm <clears throat> I'm an acupuncturist I say I'm an acupuncturist um, but I have retired now um, Covid threw us both into retirement so we're 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 a certain age and I spend a lot of my energy and focus on climate activism. Yeah, that would make yeah. sense because where you are, you're absolutely surrounded by the rural area. I mean, there's no, there's nothing but green fields and lovely farms all around you. And I, I imagine you can see some of, of climate changing in the time that you've been there, have you? The weather, the weather, even in 23, four years has changed. Um, it's wetter. <clears throat> the seasonal weather is not, the winters are not so cold. Um, the insect life is significantly reduced, even over that period. Um, and I'm also a beekeeper and Bees have really been struggling, at least the honeybee has, has really been struggling. So, so I've seen some of the, yes, some of the effects here. Yeah, so that's what we see locally, but we're, we're quite aware, aren't we, that we are just a small part of the bigger world. So what's got you fired up about climate change to actually become so um, active in the campaign? Okay, I'm... I'm um, involved with Extinction Rebellion, um, which is a well-known activist movement in Britain and globally, involved in non-violent direct action in the tradition of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and others. And its aim is to um, very simple aims, tell the truth, act as if the truth is real, and to engage, engage people in the issue through people's and citizens' assemblies. And most recently, to, um, as an aim, is to um, work for climate justice so that any mitigation 
or change that we make to support the planet during the climate crisis needs to address social justice so that at every level people will benefit and be involved. So that's where I put a lot of my energy, well, most of my energy now. And that came about fairly slowly after the last, over the last seven, eight years. Um, specifically eight years ago, I was taking my daughter to a interview in Falmouth for art school. And there's something on the news about Palestine and the Intifada. And I thought this has been going on all my life, all my life. Palestinians and the people of that area have been struggling. And I thought, what am I going to do? I've reached a certain age. Am I going to continue to avoid some of the big issues or am I going to re-engage as I was engaged in my youth? And I did some talking to people, traveled around the country, looked at the Occupy movement, which was directly addressing the issue of um, the more rapacious aspects of capitalism and growth and the financial systems. And I found there was the common sort of infighting and difficulty and lack of direction, despite some of its achievements. And then quietly through the woodwork here, I came across people who were involved in something that I hadn't directly come across, which was nonviolent communication. And I'm a, I'm talking calmly, but I'm a pretty kind. I can get very hot under the collar. Me too. <laughs> very hot under the collar. <laughs> and I have been a very hot um, activist in the past in my youth. Um, and this was something different as people walk the talk of compassionate, engaging, nonviolent communication. Then I found myself in a clinic in London where I used to work in autumn of 2018 and something was clearly happening in the city. And that was a time when Extinction Rebellion had just been formed. It had declared a climate emergency and voiced the climate emergency and had pinned a statement of rebellion to the railings outside Buckingham Palace. Rebellion against the acceptance of climate crisis. So something very vigorous, I didn't know this. What I experienced in London at the time was something was happening and there was a quiet, there was an urgency, things started to appear on the news over the course of a few days. And this group had closed the bridges, had occupied the bridges in London, the main bridges. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, there were churches involved and various groups involved. And then swiftly on from there, I found in April 2019, what they called the rebellion, when a number of sites in London were occupied for 10 days. Um, vigorously, publicly, noisily, with joy, with passion. And it quickly became apparent to me that these were people who had a direct vision of what it took, what it took to draw attention to the need to act. And very shortly after that, in the succeeding months, Parliament, not the government, but Parliament declared a climate emergency. Climate emergencies were climate emergency. I have to repeat that. 
not just climate concern, it wasn't just environmental, it was climate emergency was declared. And shortly thereafter, the Senate in Wales became the first government in the world to declare a climate emergency. And la this year, I think the church in Wales declared a climate emergency. Whether anyone is gonna act on in an emergency fashion on the climate emergency is the issue. And that's why we're still rebelliously noisy, disruptive with our nonviolent direct action. Well, the um, thing about nonviolent direct yeah. action is that you've mentioned Gandhi um, and Gandhi um, is who we always think of because of, there are people yeah. within living memory of Gandhi. But of course, Jesus would also have said the same, wouldn't he? He would have um, continued to be passive, non-aggressive and right with what he'd say um, at this time. I was actually in Argentina in two, 2002 when I saw my first noisy demonstration. Um, against the banks because the banks had had a problem and the, the currency was dropping. So they simply closed the doors and wouldn't let people in to get their money out. And the people went, came on the streets with their Coke cans and they stood for hours banging on the windows of the door. You know, they didn't, didn't hurt anybody. The police couldn't move them on. It was extremely effective um, at getting on the news. And the non-passive but determined way um, seems to be a good approach because we don't get up too many people's noses. But of course, we still do get up quite a lot of people's noses with this type of protest. But of course, that's kind of the point, isn't it? Is to actually make ourselves heard from that. How have your local church um, taken your relationship with Extinction Rebellion? Are they are they with with you on it? We have very good clergy and the group that I'm involved with Creation Care are, have surprised me in terms of, of their determination to voice the, give voice to the truth, the reality of the climate crisis. Um, and we have a new, a new priest, Jonathan Parker, who, who will speak to this issue in his, he has a wonderful, wonderful Christian manner, non-combative, um, non-confrontational, mediates, but he will speak, he will speak in church on, on these issues. We have a very, in Dravach Falindre, St. Barnabas Church, we have a very small congregation, um, as, often is the case, maybe, maybe if we're lucky, there'll be 10 people in attendance at services. Um, but we have agreed in the church, there are environmentalists who are involved. There are people who are more conservative, who perhaps haven't directly taken these issues in hand, but we have agreed to take measures in our immediate area around specifically around the churchyard to look at sustainability and biodiversity okay and um we've we've had made some steps towards being an eco church and um it it's small steps but we have engaged the broader community to an extent i wouldn't exaggerate but the ripples go out yeah. and um yeah, I feel it's challenging because I'm at the hard coal face of it, really. And I have to, to, to moderate at times, yet maintain, maintain the determination not to let this, not to be in denial, which is very easy. It's very, very easy to pull one's blanket over one's head. Um, regarding what is undoubtedly the most important issue of our time and indeed of any any time as the pope pope francis himself has said in his encyclical laudato si which i get a great deal of 
support from. Mm. And quite right too, of course, because if we're meant to be protecting the poor and the meek by continuing to allow the climate to change, it's the exact opposite, because it's the poor and the meek in the countries which are low land and already struggling with things like drought and poor crop growth who are going to continue to suffer. It seems mad for us to say, focus on giving to, I'm just using this as an example, Oxfam or £10 a week and feeling fantastic about it, but letting our taps run in our bathrooms or, or turning on the heating to full or continuing to buy as much plastic as we feel like. So we have to have that balance in our lives, don't we? Where we, we always, in everything we do, understand the impact of what we're doing. And it is a bigger thing than just us and our relationship of our fridge freezer. So it is um, it, extremely it, important. Yeah, it's absolutely. We can, as individuals, take as many good and necessary steps around sustainability, but we need to speak truth to power. And this needs government involvement and the church is the church christian church and the church in wales is is it pulls it pulls beyond its weight it pulls beyond its weight and um it is essential for the church to take a firm stand on this Absolutely. and to to act as if the truth is real yeah and um, we sometimes feel quite quite small don't we but there's that old saying you see you think you're quite small and insignificant then try and sleep in a room of a mosquito <laughs> it's one of my favorites that one from the... exactly yeah. ah the dalai lama i think oh, the dalai lama <laughs> said that as, yeah i knew it was somebody cleverer than i was definitely from well, there. <laughs> no. but the 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 church you've got has got um a hayfield i think could you tell us a little bit about that yeah, I mean, this is this is fantastic and it, it, it represents the tension between urgency, doing something now, feeling overwhelmed and the, the, the necessary cycles, the necessary life passages, the, the bigger scale of things. So we have um, our church is right bang in the middle of the village. It was, uh, it was established as such by Lord Cawdor, you know, to to the the to yeah, represent the Anglican authority and the 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 gentry class right bang in the middle, you know, of of the community. While chapels were growing and and there were obviously tensions there. And um, it has about two acres of churchyard. Um, probably just about under half of that is um, used through old graves and the new graveyard. And we have about an acre of field on a slope going up towards a wood. And it's a big green area. There are no trees in in this two acres. Um, it's a challenge to keep it neat, to keep um, because you know biodiversity, sustainability isn't always neat. You know, neat green swords of field at their extreme. You know them in East Anglia, or you when you drive through central France and there's not an insect on your windscreen. Yeah. Um, these are not sustainable. They're absolutely not sustainable without chemicals, the petrochemical industry, et cetera, et cetera. It's a different type of desert, isn't it? It's a different, it, it is a different type of desert. So we have, for the first time in 40 years, we have begun the process of making hay on this meadow, we, we'll call it a meadow now. And we've engaged our congregation and the wider community in volunteering to, 
to do this, it's required, um, I suppose, a hundred or so man hours, person, excuse me, person hours. And we have um, managed to find two wonderful local farmers who have small balers and small vehicles that can get into the field and are willing to deal with such a small area, which they've done enthusiastically. And we baled the hay, we sold the hay on. We have started to deal with the docks. So hours and hours of digging up the docks. And we have cleared paths um, with a great deal of hard work, cleared paths through it and uncovered the old church paths. And most excitingly, we've collected yellow rattle seed oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, from a local wildflower meadow. We created, we collected a kilo of seed. These are tiny little seeds yes. of the yellow rattle plant, which are a parasitic, um, a lovely parasitic traditional hay meadow flower, mm -hmm. which contributes to reducing the more vigorous grasses, which you don't want to, to overtake. And we'll see, this is our first year, but I can say that as soon as we, we that for people who don't know, but you probably all know that but a, a biodiverse hay meadow requires the grass to be taken off. And we had just for 40 years, just cut it and left it. So it yeah. was a brutal sort of vigorous, thuggish, green, grassy area with a certain amount of weed in it. And we'd had to take it off all, we had to rake up the remnants after the hay was made by hand. And it has been very hard work. And we've had to say to ourselves, well, that we're working both urgently and in the long term on this. So there's a there's a there's a, a an interesting tension. And we'll see. But as soon as the hay and grass was taken off and flowers started to appear through the shorter grass, we had butterflies and hoverflies, which were not very apparent. It no. was like they were hungry for something different to happen, for something more biodiverse. And we had the local pub fundraised for us. People have contributed financially to the cutting of the meadow. Um, the local school, which is a church school just, just next door, has been involved in starting to do a nature study survey of what it looks like now and okay. what it, and hopefully will continue over the years to see how it develops. We've had support from God's Acre, oh, which is a charity looking at exactly this to develop the biodiversity of churchyards. Local environmentalists have given us advice. And as I say, our local priest has um, been wonderfully uh, clear and outspoken and supportive in, within the church at services. And um, that's where we are at the moment. It's small, listen, this is small steps in a situation which is critically dangerous the climate crisis, the climate emergency. But we, we need to take those small steps. We need to look at the rhythms of nature as well as the other stuff. The fantastic thing about your project, Cordley, is that you've had so many people involved in it. So a lot of people wouldn't have known the difference between a traditional hay meadow and the, the hay that's cut and wrapped in black plastic, the silage meadows. Um, and so simply that raising of awareness in your area um, will already have helped to change the mind of some of the people locally. And as for the work of the school, then that's fantastic, isn't it? Because some of the butterflies and hoverflies, um, you, you just don't see them around unless people actually grow the plants suitable for them. And even then, we're still only going to get a fraction of them because we, uh, the biodiversity isn't going to be sure. there for some time to come. Um, I know where I am here in the middle of Carmarthen, I'm one of the few people who've actually still got a garden. The, the rest has been tarmacked or concreted over because of the practicalities of living in a town. 
but um, it does mean I get butterflies and bees to my to my garden, and my neighbours go, "Ooh, butterflies and bees, bugs!" <laughs> Just because they're not used to them, they haven't grown up with them, they they don't like the look of them, and you know they're a little bit frightened of what happens if one gets trapped on the window. So simply letting children come out there and your neighbours come out and enjoy that hayfield is a is a huge step forward, um, and hopefully. Um, other churches and churchyards, because we've got some some quite large spaces as well. We'll get to do it. You don't need to have such a large space, do you? You can still have a traditional yard, and then look at the other things there, from the the, the but, wax mushrooms, the lichens. So. Absolutely, and um, churchyards, old churchyards, are particularly um, fertile in terms of. It's probably the wrong word because we actually want to reduce the fertility to produce the wildflowers, but particularly abundant in terms of biodiversity if they're allowed to happen. And I was in Clinetley a month, few months ago, and they're outside the court there, which I'll let your imagination run as to why I was outside the court there, but um, as a climate activist. But there is a small area which is being managed to allow the wildflowers. And there, and also I noticed in a little bit of path, they had seeded the wildflowers. The butterflies were on them. The butterflies yeah. were on them. Whereas where the grass had been shorn in a neat way, which we can understand why we need neatness. That's why there's a tension. These things are not easy. There were no butterflies. There were no moths. There were no hoverflies. These things, the, these things are not easy, and it it will not be easy for. It's beyond not easy. It's almost inconceivable how we will get off petrol, how we will get off diesel, how we will heat our houses, how farmers will manage to operate not using the plastic not using plastic as we know it full stop, not using diesel as we know it full stop, getting their goods to market. It's almost inconceivable. Go back to XR, the thing about one of the things about Extinction Rebellion is the demand for citizens' assemblies when citizens' assemblies will be select, randomly selected from society as representations of the whole range of people and will bring in experts to help us, to guide us. So we don't have to be too scared. We, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and do this ourselves. No. This is a common problem for humanity. Yeah. And we need to bring in all the help we can, but we have to act yesterday we have yeah. to act yesterday. The, the, the foot has to be hard to the pedal now, doesn't it? We need to get hard to the pedal, shoulders to the gears. Yeah. So COP26 is coming up in just a matter of weeks now. Do you have high hopes for COP26? I'm going to hold this place with seriousness. Yeah. I'm, I'm beyond pessimistic about COP26. I think that is why there are pilgrims from the church in Wales walking to COP26, not just to applaud, applaud what might be happening. If, if COP26 was going to achieve what is required by the climate emergency, we would know about it now. We would know about it now. We would know that the countries of the world, the nations of the world are cooperating, that our government is doing more than doing the minimum. We, we would know. I think what may happen is, it may happen this will be a failure and we will realize very swiftly the severity of the situation. We have to be absolutely like clear about what is hot air now. We have to be absolutely clear that we are not being led down a path. 1.5 degrees 
above pre-industrial temperatures was flagged up in 2015 at the Paris conference. We're now talking about two degrees average temperatures and rising. I mean, I'm not here to push everyone over the edge into gloom and despair, but it's very, very, very serious. It is, it is. And it's not a new story, is it? I remember reading um, Carson's um, Silent Spring back when I was Absolutely. at college, which is an awful long time Silent ago. Silent Spring. Yeah. I have to say. And, and there's many books been written before and Absolutely. since. Absolutely. Then, uh, yes, I can't agree with you more. I think COP26 is going to have to really pull his finger out to show how amazing we can all work together and how industry and science can work together. But you're right, the political will has to be there as well, doesn't it? Um, and they have to be strong and determined. So we can only pray that when they do actually open that meeting, that they've had a good hard look at themselves in the mirror first and realise that they really are being looked at by the world to actually lead us out of this dire situation that we're in. Well, it's been great to talk to you, Audley, and thank you very much for your time this morning. Is there anything else you'd like to add at all? Any message to the people watching? Um, I'm a turn up Anglican and have been all my life. I um, and focusing on what I was going to say today has reminded me of some of the wonderful spaces and opportunities as I've said, that the church has offered me. And it, it offers me a place to be born, live and to die in, really. Though I get grumpy about certain things and I can sit there in a service, you know, feeling irritation and annoyance, but I'm, I'm the most ordinary turn up Anglican and that's where I find myself um, and have found myself but this this issue um, someone called Bill McGibbon who's a climate journalist and activist one of the most significant said and there is no way at this point in the 21st century to engage in a serious Christian witness that does not take First and foremost, this destruction of God's creation and God's people at its very heart. And that is someone voicing the truth in a better way than I can. And that's, yes. um, that's what I feel very, I need to do. Very well said, I think. Yes, yeah, very true. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for watching. There's going to be a short prayer to follow. May the blessing of light be on you, light without and light within. May the blessed sunlight shine on you like a great peat fire, so that stranger and friend may come and warm himself at you. And may light shine out of the two eyes of you, like a candle set in the window of a house, bidding the wanderer come in out of the storm. And may the blessing of the rain be on you. May it beat upon your spirit, and wash it fair and clean, and leave there a shining pool where the blue of heaven shines, and sometimes a star. And may the blessing of the earth be on you, soft under your feet as you pass along the roads, soft under you as you lie out on it, tired at the end of day. And may it rest easy over you when at last you lie out under it. May it rest so lightly over you that your soul may be out from under it quickly, up and off and on its way to God. And now may the Lord bless you and bless you kindly. Amen.